marketing to help companies shift their sales approach to helping buyers buy. He's also the export advisor to American Express, and in 2016 received a presidential E award for export excellence. And of course, being from Boston, yes, he is a Red Sox and Patriots fan. So please help me welcome Mr. Ed Marsh. So good morning. I've really been looking forward to the opportunity to speak here. First, you know, it's kind of feeling at ease being among people in the military community. There's a sense that it, for those of us that are in that community, you kind of understand that we're with our own and that makes it comfortable. The other thing that I've been thinking though is that it makes it really nice to talk to a group that's naturally predisposed toward action. Frequently, I end up speaking to groups where I'm talking to them about, geez, you gotta get moving, you gotta get doing something. This group understands that, it's embedded in us. You know, the 70% plan that's violently executed is better than a 90% plan that's timidly executed. You gotta get out and do it. All of that is just, it's, it's kind of um, part of who we are. The point that I'm gonna make today, though, is that intentionality is the key difference. Action is easy. You can kind of ease into action, but there's a moment when you become intentional. And that moment of intentionality makes the difference between doing a lot of stuff and actually having results. Last week was the 55th anniversary of the art show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, where they had this big event, had tens of thousands of people come to roll out a Matisse exhibit. Anyone see the news stories? They hung Le Bateau upside down. And I think it was six weeks and 200,000 people coming through before anybody realized it. And that's a lot like the difference between action and intentionality. It's easy to do something, but to do it right, do it with precision, do it with intent, that's a lot tougher. In the context of everything that we're talking about here today, that means, for instance, that you really have to understand who your buyers are, and we're gonna talk about a whole world of buyers. But you know, often, the discussion of buyers gets distilled down into this kind of easy one-page, sort of a thumbnail or snapshot of who you think your buyers are. And it's, it's kind of uh, a canned information. And by using that, you really miss the opportunity and the insights that are critical to be intentional as you're doing digital marketing. Every action, I would argue, whether it's a podcast or a blog post or a video or a social media tweet or a social media post, every action has to be intentional. It doesn't mean that everyone has to sell. It doesn't mean that everyone has to be intended to um, grow your business, but there needs to be intentionality behind it. There needs to be a very specific purpose, a framework for everything that you're doing. So if intentionality, if action's gonna kind of power it, if intentionality is gonna make the difference between just doing stuff and doing it really well and making a difference, there's a bigger part of a winning formula that this group brings to it. There's a tool set that we're gonna talk about, a tech stack, and an opportunity. Let's start with the tool set. You know, we're different. Sometimes we're proud of it, sometimes we're embarrassed by it, but the military community is different. We often wear that as a badge of honor, you know, the suffering that we've been through, the difficulties that we face, the things that we do that others wouldn't or couldn't, and in some cases, the things that we do that maybe we shouldn't, but it's, we're different in that way. We've been places and we've done things, and there are inherent characteristics in the military mindset, or the mindset of the military community. There's, of course, physical and moral courage. There's determination, there's grit, there's drive. There's a FIDO attitude. Again, we wear that kind of with a badge of honor. You know, okay, yeah, tell me I can't do it right. Let's see. And there's a global awareness that I think is often just assumed because so many of us have global experience but it's often not fully leveraged the way that it could be. I'll tell you a quick story about myself. In 2004, I was partners with a German company. I became partners in 2000. At the time, a euro cost us 85 cents. Our business model was, I mean, it would have been hard to lose money with a business model when we were importing and a euro cost us 85 cents. By 2004, it was headed rapidly the other direction, somewhere around $1.10 or $1.20, on its way to $1.65, which is a whole other horror show. But at about 110, I got nervous, and I said, I need a plan B. So this business where I was importing this stuff from Germany was great, it was spinning off some cash, and I started to take that cash to invest in a company that I started in India. Now, an example of that 
kind of military attitude, if you will, I decided, I picked India for reasons we'll talk about later, and I decided I was gonna go there. So what did I do? I booked a ticket, I found a hotel room, I got on a plane. At the time, there was very few direct flights between the US and India. So it was one of these 24-hour travel days. I went through Europe, get, get to India at about three in the morning, the flights all arrive very early in the morning, walk out the airport, any of you all that have been in emerging markets, you know the heat, the humidity, the, the oppressive odors, and just throngs of people, a big chain link fence with arms sticking through the fence and thousands of people. And I'm like, I don't even know how I'm going to find a taxi or how I'm going to get to my hotel, but I know that I'm going to figure it out. And that's kind of that military mindset, right? That's part of that tool set that each of us have being in this community. The tech stack that we have is really interesting. It's easy to say, well, we've got the internet. I mean, everybody gets it. The internet makes it different. I don't think what everyone appreciates is that just 10 years ago, if you were a small business, you had really no way to compete with companies that had enormous marketing budgets. And now there's almost no distinction between the two. I heard a story last night, somebody telling me they were, they got a well-funded startup they were working with, and somebody had the idea, we need to do an ad campaign. So they went to New York City and they hired an ad agency, charged $40,000 for a photo shoot, and they didn't use a single picture from it. Silly money. It used to be that budgets dictated your ability to market. Now it's your creativity. And the tech stack, although much of it is free or low cost, it gets really important when you start to think about things as Daniel was talking about, when you're building teams, when you're managing more work than you can handle. And so one of the things that you're gonna hear about tomorrow morning that I'm really excited about, I'm thrilled to be one of the people that's early moving this initiative along is HubSpot for Veterans. HubSpot, if you're not familiar with it, is a software program. It's a, almost a, a, a in-one tech stack that lets you manage so many aspects of your digital marketing. But HubSpot for Vets goes a step further and it rolls into it a lot of coaching and learning. And even more, there's, there's mentorship and there's other um, uh, paths, uh, learning paths, that are actually taken from some of the leading incubators in the country, like Mass Challenge and Y Combinator. So it's an incredible tech stack along with other, other uh, learning resources with it, and it's available really inexpensively for members of the military community vets, transitioning vets, active duty with a side hustle and spouses. So that's really cool. The opportunity though is often an afterthought. You know, we get an idea and we start doing something. And we say, okay, well we're doing it now, we're gonna market it. But we don't even stop to think about where we're gonna market it to. In the world, where it used to be that you had to go find the customers, you had to go find the employees, you had to go find the influencers, you had to go find all of these resources, the financing, et cetera, for your business, you were constrained by your budget and by geography. But now in a world where digitally, everybody comes and finds you, if you do it really well, if you do it the way you're gonna be talking about over the next couple days here, they find you. And so that means we're no longer constrained by people on your block or in your city or in your neighborhood or in your state or in your region, even in your country. Now the buyers from all around the world can find you. There's a statistic I haven't seen where it's cited, so I don't know for sure, but enough people say it that there must be some validity to it. Supposedly there are more internet connected mobile devices in the world than toothbrushes. Think about that. It was kind of scary. I mean, sometimes sitting on some of these flights, you can tell the person next to you probably has the mobile connected device and maybe not the toothbrush. But it's, it's an amazing number to think about. I've personally carried Nigerian cell numbers, German and Indian, and I'm sure that many of you living around the world have carried other cell numbers with you as well. And many emerging markets you go into, you know, here in the US increasingly you see people with a personal number and a business number. But many emerging markets, you go and you sit down at, a, at, a, at, at the table for a meeting and people drop three devices onto the table because you never know which network the generator at the transmission tower is going to run out of diesel or the software is going to be fried or it's just simply going to be overloaded. And if you want to be in touch, you've got to have multiple networks. So this connection changes the whole idea of where your opportunity is and what your potential market is. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce, 95% of the world's buyers are outside the U.S. 95%. So when you hear some of these amazing stories about 
rapid growth of startup companies that kind of focus on a domestic market, think about what that opportunity means. And being part of this military community that has that gumption, that has that international experience, is well within your grasp. So how does all this fit together? We've got this base of action. We've got very specific intentionality that takes action and turns it into results. And then we've got this tool set, a tech stack, and an opportunity. How do we mix that all up? I think the biggest thing to keep in mind is that we're all selling all the time. You know, in many, in many groups, there's a hesitance to talk about selling. Well, selling is kind of a dirty word. And marketing sounds a little bit more sophisticated. But, you know, the reality is we're all selling all the time. Whether we're trying to get our kids to clean our rooms or trying to agree with our spouse on where we're going to take vacation, or if you're a spouse that envisions a career path between duty stations and you're looking to try to build that next step in, your, in, in that arc of your career, or a transitioning vet who's wondering how to, how to transition out of the military and find the great civilian opportunity, or small business people, whether it's a side hustle or the actual business that you've, that you've undertaken as a spouse or as a vet. We're all selling all the time. The digital gives us huge power and huge reach. So another quick story about myself, and I'll preface this by saying I'm a grunt, and so you can take it for what it's worth, and some of you are gonna chuckle, but the point in my telling you that is not to, not to tell some kind of a story about myself as though I'm unique, but it's really to put it in the context that if a grunt can do it, then there, anybody can do it, right? So you can approach this as marketing and branding yourself, and or marketing and branding a small business. And the global opportunity exists in either case, probably more for small businesses, but for those of you that move around the world, particularly for spouses that think again about finding that career progression and the next job opportunity in that career arc in different places that are going around the world, it's absolutely applicable in that regard too. So in 2011, after my two businesses that were supposed to be these offsetting businesses that were going to give me a uh, you know kind of stability and diversification, instead they collapsed simultaneously. So I was thrashing around and I'm wondering what am I going to do? Just as I'm facing college tuitions and private high school tuition and all kinds of other problems, so I was doing a lot of different things, trying to fight my way through that transition. But in 2011, I noticed there was a lot of this blogging going on, and I didn't completely understand it. But I knew that there were a lot of people writing. A lot of them were the angry people in their basement wearing their pajamas all day writing these political screeds. But there was also a lot of interesting blogging that was going on too. And I said, you know, I'm not quite sure how this is going to fit, but I want to begin to do it. I want to experiment with it. And international business was what I worked on. That was what I knew well. So I started blogging about international business, you know, once a week, once every couple of weeks, just trying to build the muscle a little bit. In 2012, I kind of said, you know what, instead of just writing, maybe I should start writing to tell my story a little bit more, to begin to market myself. And so I began to do that, add a little bit of that angle to it. I still found myself writing a lot of stuff that in retrospect looks like junk, but was kind of writing for the sake of writing, because I said, I got to learn how to blog. In 2014, though, something changed. I kind of, one day I said, I'm spending all this time doing this. And I'm not clear why I'm doing it. And at that point, I decided to get intentional about it. And I got intentional by being very clear with myself about who I was trying to reach, what I wanted to discuss with them, who I wanted them to find me, what I wanted them to think about me, et cetera. And the funny thing happened. So that was early in 2014. Late in 2014, I'm sitting there one day, or actually standing. I use a standing desk because, I mean, it bothers me so much. I used to run PT. I used to be in great shape. Now I've got this belly. And so I'm doing everything I can to try to stay in shape, including a standing desk. So I'm standing there. My phone rings, I answer the phone, and somebody says, this is so-and-so, I'm calling from M. Booth in New York City. Well, I live in this small town north of Boston, and like I said, I'm a grunt, so I don't know about all this fancy stuff in New York City. I quickly look online and I discover, this is a PR agency. Actually, these are serious people. This is the PR agency of record for American Express and Mercedes-Benz and a bunch of other brands. So I say, oh, well, I probably better pay attention. So they say they got to send me an NDA. I say, okay, fine, send it. Do a little bit more research. And what begins is a series of conversations over the next several months. 
I won't go into a ton of detail, but I want to just give you a sense of it so you see what that intentionality did. The gist of it was that this PR agency of record for American Express had come up with a plan that American Express liked. American Express does a lot of neat programs for small businesses, for women-owned businesses, for government contracting businesses, and they're all delivered free of charge through the open forum. There's content, there are events, there's programs designed to help inspire small businesses. And American Express, obviously, long-term, believes that they'll accrue some brand value from it and some business, but it's really done, I can tell you from inside, with very altruistic intentions. They decided that they wanted to complement those other programs they had with a program built around exporting for small and medium-sized businesses. And so Amex told Booth, you need to go plan this program for us, and you need to find somebody to be kind of the face of the program. Now, obviously, they didn't hire me to be the face of the program. Obviously, they could have found a lot of other better people than, than I for that. But they needed somebody as a spokesman and somebody familiar with the content that could help organize events, help MC events, help create content, help plan it, et cetera. So M Booth went away, and they started Googling. And I kept coming up. And Amex told them to come back with a list of 10 people, and M Booth came back, and they gave him my name. And Amex said, well, yeah, OK, he looks OK, but we wanted 10 people. And M Booth said, everywhere we look, he's the one we keep finding. So the point of that, again, as a grunt, I was banging out a lot of written material. And in 2014, when I got intentional, about writing about stuff that was answering the questions I knew people were asking in the ways that was important to them, then suddenly it started to work. And it ended up helping me get American Express as a client. Now that's me branding myself in the same kind of way that any of you can do. But sometimes we're talking about it not in the context of branding ourselves, but, but, but a small business, growing a small business. Anyone here heard of Hamilton, Missouri? I hadn't either. Small town, 1,800 people. I don't know the geography well. I can't tell you exactly where in the state it is. But in 2008, this lady you see on the screen here, Jenny Doan, was in kind of a tough spot. You know, 2008, 2009 was a tough time for many of us. She was worried about her house. Was she going to hold on to her house? So her kids, her son and daughter, who you see there in the picture with her as well, they said, we've got to help mom somehow. And Jenny was a big quilter. I'm not a quilter myself, so I may, for any of you that are, you may recognize my ignorance and some of the terms that I use. But basically, she had a hobby where there was pre-cut fabric that is used by people who like quilting. I guess it simplifies the process. So they said, let's set her up in a business. Let's help her run this business to sell pre-cut quilting fabric. So they took out a couple loans, they built a website, and nothing happened. You know, the pucker factor is starting to go up now, right? Well, her son, about a year later, her son said, you know what, how about if we start doing some YouTube videos? Well, Jenny Doan is now an internet sensation. Her first YouTube video was as awkward as you would expect, kind of filmed with some sort of a low-quality camera sitting at the kitchen table. It's still up there. It's got millions of likes, like hundreds of her videos that have over a million likes. When I was looking for some details on this for another speech I gave a couple months ago, I actually found one at the time that in three days had over 75,000 likes. Crazy. Over the years, she's gotten, she's progressed. They're slightly more polished now. But there's still that very genuine kind of intense personal caring that comes across in her videos answering questions. So these videos aren't talking about pre-cut fabric. These videos are talking about techniques. How do you stitch this? How do you sew that? Again, I don't know the details of it, but helping people understand how to do certain kinds of quilting things. So what happened, obviously, they got intentional. It's not enough to have a website. It's not enough to just you know, send out some social media posts. You have to be very clear about who you're trying to reach. But it didn't just change Jenny's life and business. Hamilton, Missouri, this town of 1,800 people, if you want to understand the impact of this, we talk about community and how we can help each other and how in the military community we can create jobs for other military members, et cetera. This town of 1,800 people was struggling. There was a lot of rundown buildings, nine of which have now been renovated downtown. They revitalized the downtown to support Missouri Star Quilting Company. Further, they've built a hotel. Now, why does a company selling pre-cut fabric Need a hotel in this small town? Because 10 to 15,000 visitors a month from around the world come to Hamilton, Missouri to attend this quilting academy. 
seriously. So you talk about the difference between action and intentionality. You talk about the reach of the internet, the ability to build a global business to find markets that you can't even imagine. It's incredible. And what Jenny did, she conveyed through her videos this sense of expertise that made people comfortable and made people value her. And there is no reason that any of us through our digital marketing can't do exactly the same thing. If you're a transitioning military member, you want your prospective employer to feel exactly the same way about you. If you're running a small business and you're trying to find employees, you want your employees to feel, potential employees to feel exactly the same way about you. So creating that sense is what it's about. Now you're gonna hear during this event a number of other stories. What I wanna do is just give you a couple quick examples. It could be, it could be um, the, the grunt story that we heard this morning or any number of others. But these are illustrative. Dollar Shave Club, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It was an idea, there was no business. A $4,500 video filmed in a rented warehouse when there was no business turned into a business worth a couple hundred million dollars in very short order. GoPro, you know, they were selling cameras. They were selling a million bucks a year worth of cameras. And they got intentional about user-generated content. We talk about marketing budgets. They weren't even worried about their marketing budget. They had all their customers. They paid customers to do their marketing for them, or customers paid them to buy a camera to do the marketing for them. Billion dollar business a few years later. Alicia Schaffer probably haven't heard of her. Like myself, 2008 was a hard time for her. She had a store. She was selling designs, her, her, her clothing and jewelry design. She had to shut it down, went out of business. A year later, she went on Etsy, and now she's one of Etsy's largest, selling, or largest sellers globally, selling stuff all over the world through Etsy. Nine Line, you heard a great apparel story this morning. Nine Line went from 2012 nothing to recently uh, Shopify, or Big Commerce, I think, identified them as the fastest growing online apparel retailer in the country. That's a domestic story. The nature of their product tends to be domestic. You know, they've got a, a community, this military community that buys it. There's probably not a lot of people in international markets that are going to buy it, but it shows the leverage of the digital tool set. And of course, we can't talk about success stories without talking about Cortez. I mean, the fact that we're all here today. What an amazing story of vision and determination and grit to make it happen. So you're gonna hear a lot about action. You need to blog this many times. You need to do this many social media posts. You need to do this, you need to do that. I'm gonna tell you that you need intentionality because the action isn't enough. That's two dimensions. What are we gonna do now to build this third dimension? I say we're going to go global. Show of hands. Who here has deployed, lived overseas? Almost everybody, exactly. And that makes this group quite unique. If we were talking about a normal business event, you wouldn't find that to be the case. So where many American companies hesitate to do business globally, it's like a no-brainer for this group. It's, it's, it, it's a simple transition. Many American companies hesitate to export. And I want to tell you a little bit of the reason why to inoculate you. Because when you go back and you hopefully get excited and start thinking about how you can take your business or, or your, your marketing global, you're going to have people tell you, oh, it's crazy, it won't work, it's too risky. So I'm going to quickly lay out for you the reason you hear that and why it's wrong. And it's only become wrong in the last couple of years. See, it used to be that what would happen if a company decided that they wanted to go international, they would say, okay, we're going to make this decision, we're going to commit resources to it. And so what do we have to do next? We have to decide where we're going to go. And so what they would do is they would call the interns, send the intern to the library. They'd call one of the government offices and say, tell us where we ought to be. And they'd do some quote-unquote research. They'd basically look at population numbers, and they would look at trade numbers what markets imported most of a certain product or service. And then they'd overlay the two on top of each other. So they ended up going to India like I did or to China like a lot of other people did. And they'd end up in situations where they were in markets where they didn't belong. Of course, it's different now. 
So instead of having that decision where you go pour money into a market, you send executives over, you lose your focus on your domestic business, you end up in all sorts of regulatory complications with other tax filings and registrations and HR rules and all kinds of other stuff. Instead of that, and a decision after three or five years where you say we're losing money, should we keep at it? Is it gonna turn around? Are we gonna make it work? Now you've got an opportunity where you can identify before you go where you ought to be. You're gonna collect data. And you're going to have two kinds of data. Anybody in, in this group that kind of works in a digital world is certainly familiar with aggregate data, Google Analytics, that sort of thing. You're going to know where your visitors come from, how many come, uh, how many come from each place, whether they're using mobile or desktop devices, how long they spend on your site, how many pages they go to, uh, what page they come in on, what page they leave from, all that kind of stuff to give you a sense. You're also going to get anecdotal data. As you start to get inquiries and start to sell deals, you're going to get a sense of what markets you can comfortably sell into, where language is a barrier or where it isn't, where shipment is a problem or where it isn't, where you've got customs hassles, where payments become really problematic or where they're easy, where service after the sale is easy, where you get repeat sales afterwards. So you're going to have your own data, aggregate data, and you're going to have your own anecdotal data, and now you're going to build a matrix that's going to be much more helpful to you. It's going to give you the tool set you need rather than to just do action to be intentional about it. It's going to let you target markets successfully. So you start getting some international leads. You're doing your digital marketing. The people are finding you domestically and then internationally. You start getting some of these inquiries. And where many American companies are going to hesitate, you're not going to because you've lived internationally. You don't get freaked out about foreign currency. You've gone to the ATM machine, pulled US dollars out of your account, and gotten foreign currency. You're comfortable with that. You've shipped overseas. It may have been to an APO box or maybe back to the US, but you've shipped overseas. You've traveled. You've got cultural experience. You understand all these things. They don't freak you out. They're natural to you, unlike to many businesses that worry about them. So you're going to start to respond to leads. And what I find consistently is my clients, I tell them this is going to happen, and they say, oh, well, no, we've never had any demand for this. And it starts to happen. I got a, an email from a client of mine in Nashville yesterday morning who said, that deal that came out of the blue in Romania a couple months ago, we're getting ready to ship it. And meanwhile, we've got another one from South Korea worth $50,000. It happens if you're willing to follow up on them. It's amazing. So 95% of the world's buyers are outside the U.S., but you don't want to go after all 95% of them. You don't want to make some sort of a hypothetical speculative decision. So you've got this data that you've accumulated, so now you can make a decision based on your product, your company, your preferences, and your real experiences. When you do that, and you start to target markets, you can take a very incremental approach. The idea is that you don't want to bet your company on this. You want to take small steps that you can do comfortably, that you can do inexpensively, and that you can do with low risk. You want to take them without having to go and open up an office. I mean, maybe you'll travel there, maybe you'll go to a trade show, but you're not going to start with that. So what kinds of steps can you take? This is where digital marketing, and particularly a tool, a tech stack like HubSpot, gives you incredible power. So I'll give you some examples. But before I do, I want to talk about translation, because translation is something that often comes up where people assume, oh, i got to translate. And I would argue, please don't. There's a time and a place for it later on. But if you start to translate up front, first of all, you're going to create a huge project for yourself. Second of all, you're going to create a lot of expense. And third, you're going to get a lot of crummy translation that isn't going to help you. In fact, it's going to hurt you. Let me tell you what I mean. If you put a Google Translate widget on your website, number one, it's free. Number two, it's, I don't know. 700 languages or something like that. And number three, everybody knows what they're getting. So it's mediocre translation, and that's OK. What they want, what they expect, what they know they're going to get from Google is machine translation that's going to make it easier for them to read. On the other hand, if you go and you hire a translator and pay however many cents or dollars a word, what they're going to do is take your words with your American value, uh, um, um, unique selling value or, or, or proposition, value proposition, that you've written in American English for American buyers, and they're going to change the words and 
and create a message that's irrelevant in probably reasonable foreign language. And you're going to look silly. I've seen a number of American companies, I work a lot with capital equipment and automation and industrial manufacturers. So companies, for instance, that talk a lot about saving money, their products are designed to reduce labor costs. So they'll take very carefully written justifications for reducing labor cost. They'll translate them. They'll take them to a trade show in, a, in an emerging market where labor costs are low, and they'll fail. And they'll wonder, well, geez, nobody's interested in it. Well, nobody's interested in cutting their labor costs, but they're interested in harmonizing their solutions across multinational plants. They're interested in consistent quality, so when the inspectors from Western buyers come in, they know that they're doing it right. They're, they're interested in avoiding downtime because they've got the same shipping time frame um, pressures that everybody else. So you have to understand what the value proposition is that you're selling in a market. And you have to understand how buyers are different. And only when you do that can you begin to translate. So the first incremental step that I recommend companies think about is a good example of where this is an issue. So I say, try a few foreign language keywords. Now you can't take your American keywords and translate them. I mean, think about what we do to try to identify the right keywords in American English. There's a lot of nuance, there's a lot of inference, there's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of data that we look at, and this is an evolutionary process. So what are you gonna do? You've worked on trying to find the right American English keywords now for the last six years, and you're gonna pick a couple of them, and you're gonna hire somebody and put that into another language? It completely misses all of the cultural context around what people are searching for, what their motivations are, what their problems are. So you can't translate keywords directly. You have to really understand from a local perspective what they ought to be, what they ought to be. But the good news is you've got prospects, you've had inquiries, you've got customers, you've got people you tried to sell to and didn't get the deals done. So you can talk to them, you can interview them, you can ask them. Find out what they were searching for and start to use those. That's an easy step. A couple pages on your website. Maybe you translate a page or rather transcreate a page. So rather than just change the language, Maybe you pick a landing page. So a landing page in our lexicon, if you're not familiar with it, is a page where you strip out a bunch of other stuff and you put a simple form on it and you sell what your offer is. So maybe you've got a guide that people can download or some sort of a, you know, a value add thing that you offer them at no charge in exchange for their contact details. So take that landing page and change it. Put it in a language and a context that makes sense to them. You can do that pretty inexpensively. So you've got keywords and you've got a landing page. Then maybe you create some local language content. Now, which markets are you creating this for? Some of those that you figured out from your analysis have potential. And you may be surprised at what those are. I see often with clients, we're talking about Poland or Colombia or Turkey or Vietnam. Markets which are really manageable from an international business perspective, where with one or two um, distributors maybe, or with one in-country person, you could really do a very substantial, incredible job in the market. So you targeted those markets, you, and you're following this incremental step. Maybe you create some local language content. An interesting story, HubSpot, the company has rolled out this HubSpot for Vets program to give you this amazing tech stack um, inexpensively, has a similar story themselves. They don't do a very good job telling it. But they started out as a company doing marketing software for marketers to help them market. And that was the digital environment that they existed in. They started getting a lot of leads. They started getting a lot of international leads. And what they realized was that there were pockets of them that were coming. So they started to gradually target those markets using the analytics and the metrics they collected. And for example, at one point along the way, they decided our first for, their first foreign language blog was gonna be in German. And they started blogging in German. Not translating their existing stuff from English, but writing stories specific to what they understood the German market wanted. As another step, you might get a top-level domain. So reserve your .de or .pl or .vn domain. Maybe you create a microsite, five pages, that talks about what you're doing specific, not just in the language, but culturally appropriate, understanding the buyers there and the buyer personas there. Maybe you even host that microsite in the same IP range as that TLD, so that you really start to connect the dots for the local search engines. I will tell you that the HubSpot tech stack includes a lot of really powerful global features. So there's functionality in there to manage from a single CMS 
you can manage a number of different language pages, subdirectories, not, uh, not separate websites. There's some technical nuance there, but there's an amazing power built into it for those of you that kind of find this international opportunity enticing. So this incremental approach, which can then culminate in very sophisticated SEO in each of these markets that you're targeting, allows you to do this, again, very low risk, very low cost, working from your office here in the US without a bet the company kind of a gamble on it, without a huge speculation, without a ton of money spent on it that you wonder if you'll ever get back, without one of those awkward decisions in three to five years, do we do the right thing? And what this group has that most don't is kind of a natural understanding of that environment because you've been there. So a quick little bit about myself. I told you that I was a grunt. I'm a consultant. I work primarily with B2B companies. And I work with them on strategy and revenue growth. One of the things, and this may resonate with some of you that have experience in the B2B world, there's a lot of American companies that are incredibly sophisticated about how they manufacture their products, and they're really naive about how they sell them. They're completely 21st century in the manufacturing, and they're kind of mid-20th century in how they sell. And so adapting the approach to how buyers buy and helping them on the front end of their business be as sophisticated on the back end is the kind of work that I do. I'm the export advisor to American Express. I'm a HubSpot partner, and I'm one of the early kind of instigators for this HubSpot for Vets program that, again, I'd be happy to chat with anybody about after this or at the reception this evening, and I think there's a session on it tomorrow morning. I'm also a VFW post commander, or I was. And in that role, I've been a very active proponent of entrepreneurship. You know, entrepreneurship has helped me and my family live a life that certainly has challenging days, but has been incredibly rewarding for us. And I know that many in the military community, you know, we expect more of our bosses and our, of our coworkers than sometimes civilians do. And that can be frustrating. And I think that entrepreneurship is an enormous opportunity for many in the military community to be the man. Instead of griping about them, instead of getting frustrated because they don't have a clue and they're not willing to work hard and they don't do what it takes to get done, go and do it yourself. So I believe very much in entrepreneurship and vetrepreneurship. In fact, I led a pilot program as a commander of VFW Post where we took Vet to CEO, which is an established online program, which I think is a neat program, a lot of potential, but I think overlooks a huge central function of entrepreneurship training, which is put people at the same table and bash each other over the head and challenge each other on ideas and have really engaged conversation, which I don't think you can really do online. So a great scalable model, but I wasn't convinced that it really delivered the way that it could. So I said, let's do this pilot. There's empty veterans clubs in every town around the US every night of the week. Let's take this asset of an empty club Let's take this online program and deliver it in person, and let's show that it works. So I went and I raised 45 grand. We spent 15 running the program. We had $30,000 in prize money that we gave away to three entrepreneurs. In fact, I saw one of them sitting out here who left partway through the discussion, but Courtney, um, she's, uh, she's an interesting lady, another former Army engineer that has built an entrepreneurship story. But anyway, entrepreneurship is something that's important to me. I also. My connection with the military community isn't just my own service as a veteran. I've got three boys who have served or are serving. My oldest was Air Force Intel and then the DIA. My middle son is actually in the middle of an NTC rotation right now. I'm probably pretty unhappy with life at the moment. Um, and my youngest is just about to graduate school and going into the Army as, a, I think, a field artillery officer. So any of this stuff that we've talked about, experience trying to do business in India or digital marketing or anything in between. I'm happy to chat about after this or um, throughout the course of the next couple days. What I'll leave you with is a free guide that I'd love to send you. If you're kind of intrigued by this idea, if you give me your business card, I'll send you this free guide that outlines this process of how you take this base of digital marketing that you're doing anyway because you're hearing about how important it is as part of who you are and how you run your business how to take that base of work you're doing anyway and intentionally grab the global opportunity that goes with it. So drop me your business card at the end and I'll send that to you. So it's been a pleasure and I think we've got some time now for questions, right? So do you have any questions?
questions, I will go ahead and bring you the microphone and you'll be able to ask it to Ed. So any questions over here? Hi, I'm Jen McDonald from Military by Owner. Hi, Jen. So I do the content for them and then also blog on the side. And I think many of us do our own blogging and then also write for companies. So I know you were talking about having the readers get to know you. So can you give us some advice on that balance between when you're writing for a business or representing a business, how much of yourself and your, your backstory are like getting, letting the readers know you as a person? How, what's that balance? So if you're a ghostwriter, I mean, that's a tricky well, question. Um, I believe very strongly that, that people want to do business with people. Now, you have to, I, I also object personally, but it's kind of my own bias or pet peeve. I don't like gimmicks. Um, and so trying to, trying to walk that line in between the two is tough sometimes. My industrial clients tend to think of kind of typical boilerplate corporate speak, which drives me nuts and is ineffective. So w with that context, my recommendation is to be very clear about the voice. And I think the voice ought to be conversational. It ought to be professional. I'm a horrible speller. And so, I mean, I f I'm so embarrassed by the number of typos and stuff that I make, even after I've proofread it three, three or four times. So it should be correct, and I often fail that myself, but as long as you're grammatically correct, easy to read, and have a voice that's conversational and friendly and approachable, I think it works. I mean, I, I try to say to people, people say, well, I don't know how to write this. Where do I start? Okay, well, what if you're at a party? You're at a Super Bowl party. You're talking to somebody, and they say, well, what do you do, and how can you help me? Well, you have a conversation, and that's really exactly what you're doing is you're having a conversational approach is important. Does that help? There. Um, my name is Patty Barron. I'm with the Association of the United States Army. And I was really interested in the VFW uh, story that you just uh, shared. It must have been difficult at first to get folks to attend because uh, the aging population within associations and, and also military service and VSOs um, organizations. Um, it, it's difficult to break that barrier. How did you do that? How did you get the younger folks to come and attend some of the events that you were hosting? We didn't try to make them members. I mean, that, that seems to be the big hang-up. Um, on the other hand, you know that many of these, so, so there was two challenges. One was the members that had to approve. I said, look, I'll lead this effort. I'll do this. I need at least five grand to make it happen, bare bones. And I'm not going to go bother raising the money in case I can't. You know, I got to commit to running this, and if you won't fund the five grand. So we had a fight for a couple months about whether they'd spend five grand. And this is a VFW post, long story, but has an endowment and hundreds of thousands of dollars available. And it was still hesitation about doing it. We finally did. We started getting the money coming in. There was no participation among the members, and I'm kind of speaking very frankly here, um, no participation among the members, and very little enthusiasm or engagement until an article came out in the VFW magazine six months later. And they said, oh, that's really cool. Our post is in the magazine. Yeah, well, it kind of happened magically, right? Um, what we did to register people was to talk about the challenges they had, where we know many of them are doing GI Bill schooling, many of them are parents, many of them are working full time, they're juggling all these things, and many of them have a side hustle. And so concentrating on side hustle, on how they're educating themselves, how they're improving themselves, and how this program would help them do so, that broke down the barrier. As opposed to coming to a meeting with a bunch of old curmudgeons where I'm not gonna take the time away from my family or I've got homework to do, Instead, it was an opportunity to enrich and develop themselves, which many veterans are fully on board with. So we didn't make it about joining the VFW. We made it about, here's a resource in the community. Here's a course to come and take, and a bunch of prize money that you could win, too. Ed, my name's Anna Rabe. I have a question. So I don't know. I, I kind of have a good problem <laughs> in that I am getting interest from uh, overseas locations. I do have a couple of overseas clients now. Okay. Um, I do a lot of content. Uh, I have a, comp a communications consulting company that produces content predominantly for law firms, um, service providers, professional service providers and technology-based companies um, that are providing a service. And the problem I'm having is that my husband's still active duty. I'm an Australian Army vet. Um, he's still active duty. And some of the... I don't know how to put this, although I'm in a room of people who will understand... I'm having to walk a fine line sometimes in terms of the locations of some of the people that are interested and who I'm engaging with because I am walking a line in terms of 
uh, both OPSEC and, and PERSEC a lot of the time. And, and as I said, this is probably the only room where I could ask this question and people aren't going to look at me funny. Um, I've taken a pretty conservative approach, but I know that I've also turned away potentially great business as a consequence that so may or may not have been a risk. So my question to you is, do you have any advice for, I guess, a decision-making matrix on this? Like, how do I do this in a way that protects my family, but also recognises that there is huge growth out there that I haven't even begun to tap into? So I can't tell you that I've built any sort of a matrix oh, to answer fine. it. I get um, that. But I can tell you that I think there's a couple guidelines. I always, one of, one of the things that I kept in mind was I never wanted to get off an airplane somewhere and worry about where the police are going to be waiting for me. And, I mean, I know there's a guy named Richard Bistrong, a great story that you can read. He's a friend of mine who sold body armor around the world, ended up wearing a wire for two years as part of an international investigation, going to jail for nine months, and got completely caught up in FCPA, which for any of you who aren't familiar with it, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act talks about the um, role of corruption in getting business. And it's got real teeth to it, and it's got very long arms. Things, I mean, for instance, as an officer and a director of a company, you are personally, criminally liable for actions taken that make a material difference in getting business, even if they're done by a third party and you're not aware of them. So you need to be very careful about it. That being said, most of the businesses that folks here are in aren't an issue. The one caveat I'll give you, even if you're not selling to a foreign government, in many cases you may be without realizing it. So if you sell medical devices, you're selling to a ministry of health in most cases, which is the federal government. And if you're selling products that are shipping, they're going through customs, that's federal government. And in many cases, customs agents are underpaid because they expect to collect bribes. So FCPA is one thing to keep in mind. And just be aware of the propensity for corruption in certain markets. In terms of OPSEC, I mean, if you're talking about lawyers, it doesn't feel like it's going to be a big yeah, issue. That has a big issue as well. There's also denied party. I mean, the U.S. government, I'm not familiar with the Australian government, I don't know where you're a citizen of, but the U.S. government has lists that are published that identify, well, first of all, there's certain countries in the world to whom we cannot sell. We can't sell to Iran. Sudan just came off the list. We can't sell to North Korea. There's a couple of those. But there's also a list of companies and people that the U.S. government has identified as being nefarious actors, and we're not allowed to sell to them. So technically, any time you sell something internationally, you're supposed to check against the denied party list to make sure that, that they're not somebody you shouldn't be dealing with. Now, the kind of stuff that you're doing, if you're writing content for lawyers, it's probably not an issue. If you're selling special aluminum that can be used to do certain things in military and defense, then it's more likely to be concerned about it. But does that help? Sure. Awesome. So we have about time for one more question, and then we'll be um, moving on to our break. All right. Maybe a quick one. Um, is there a difference for the Google readability score when you're going international as far as like laying out your blog post? I don't know if you know that. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff with language tags and other kinds of okay. nuance to be aware of. In terms of keyword density, I'm not aware of okay. differences. I think basic best practice for headlines and subheads and bullet lists to help people scan it. I think that those are important. Okay. Um, one that kind of prompts a thought, talking about language, if I go to Brazil and do business, I have to have an interpreter. I can't, I can't speak Portuguese, I can understand a little bit, but I can't do business in Brazil without an interpreter. On the other hand, I see a lot of Brazilians that visit my clients' websites and convert as leads and download information and interact by email. And so I think written English, part of the reason that people find they get international leads from American English websites, even from non-English speaking countries, is because written English is fairly easily accessible to many people, as long as they have time to kind of digest it and think about it, as opposed to conversation, which can be a little bit trickier. But I'm sure there's all kinds of nuance and detail. There's a great resource to look at if you really want to get very specific about SEO internationally, Aleda Solis is an amazingly knowledgeable lady that's got a lot of information online. So, a -L, uh, I can't spell, I already told you that, right? So let's say <laughs> A-L-E-Y-D-A, -E I think, S-O-L-I-S. Um, I'm happy to connect with anybody that wants to on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn URL is up there. And again, I'd love to send you the guide. If you want to just drop me a business card. Thanks so much for your time. <laughs>